Hey folks, we're back. I'm your host, BKP. We're at Circuit World here in Blue Ridge, Georgia. It is pouring the rain now. We're going to get a nice ground soak here at the end of February, which means we'll get those nice March. Oh, what? This is Moby. What? Stealing the show. What, Moby? Who's the Moby? It's not time for Pet of the Week. This is supposed to be Ask the Doc. You have to go. You have to go. Here. I'll hold him for a minute. Don't this cry. This is Ask the Doc, Ask the Dog today. Bill's, Bill's away on business. We're going to get in trouble. I could tell it. Anyhow. <laughs> so, let, how you doing, Dr. Tim? And Dr. Yes. Dr. Whaley is... Uh, He's gone on training. He's, he's being <laughs> ethicized. Yes, he is. He is going through. Uh, he, Dr. Whaley is now a city council member here in Blue Ridge, and they have to go for um, uh, their, uh, I, I call it training or whatever, but just uh, we'll, we'll say whatever. And uh, and we will, well, I, I for sure he'll tell us about it next week. Yeah. We're going to hear all about it. So we have Dr. Raymond Tidman and this is Moby. First of all, tell us who you're bringing this morning. Okay, so this is our newest uh, family member. Yeah, and this is actually Leo's son. And his name, he's, he's nine weeks old with uh, razor teeth, which he's showing me right now. Ouch. Um, and he's, he's missing his big bro. He's missing his big bro. So he may get a little whimpery on me because if Leo was here, they'd be like on each other. Well, you know, this is Ask the Doc, but let me let me say this to you. Uh, I mean, let, let's start there, okay? Because you we, we have questions for general practitioners out there. Um, is it good for your health to have a pet? Great question. Uh, there are actually studies that show that, that, that pa parents, particular, I mean, elderly folks in particular who have a pet, have better longevity. Speaking of which, do you know do you know how to tell who loves you more, your spouse or your dog? Okay, let's go. Well, you lock both of them in the trunk of a car for an hour, and you come back, and you see who's excited to see you. Folks, I have no control over <laughs> some things on the program. Works uh, every time. I'm so, I'm serious. But I mean, um, is is it like and and I, is is it a pet? Is it is it good for? Is it good for uh, um, your blood pressure? Is it good for, I mean, is it, how, what? There, there are literally studies on that. Lower blood pressure, increased longevity. Uh, you know, I, there's just something about a pet, particularly dogs, but people, they're cat people, that, um, that add value to their lives, add comfort to their lives. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a pet person. Okay, so uh, I wanted to pick out a couple uh, a couple um, questions that sometimes we don't get an opportunity to talk about. So, what is the the what is like high blood pressure? If you have high blood pressure, how does that affect your health down the road? I mean, let's say let's say you know you're in your forties and you're already starting a high blood pressure and you're taking medication. How does how does that affect your health down the road? Okay, so a high blood pressure. Uh, is, you know, it's an interesting question because high, high blood pressure wasn't a disease. And it's only been a disease for 100 years now, maybe less. When, when uh, Franklin Roosevelt had what we call now accelerated hypertension, the theory was that he had to have that high of a blood pressure to get blood to his brain. Uh, not, it's not a working theory because he died of a stroke, but... Um, High, so high blood pressure is, think of it this way, if you're a guy and you're a mechanic and you've got your engine idle set too high or your pressure's too high in your engine, then you're unnecessarily wearing out your engine. Right. Okay. So if your heart muscle is having to do that extra work of pushing that, that blood around at a higher pressure, it is working the heart harder and it's hammering all those arteries harder. So that brings me to the second point that I really think needs to be made is having a diagnosis of hypertension and being on a medicine is not good enough okay the question is is your blood pressure controlled now we have a saying we have a saying in primary care now the lower the better but we don't want you so low that you're passing out right 
but we also don't want you, we definitely don't want you above systolic 140, that's the top number, or diastolic 90, that's the bottom number. Okay, we, want, we want to keep it below those two numbers absolutely as a goal. So if you are, quote, diagnosed hypertensive, and you, you're running blood pressures 150 over 95 on medications, your doctor needs to add medications or change medications. It's not good enough to just have the diagnosis and be on a pill. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. So what is, what is I ideal for? Is it different for men and women? Is it, what, no, what I is it? That's interesting. So the numbers the same for men and women. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, there's a little bit of a rub for me at, coming from my engineering background. One of the most important numbers that you get in a doctor's office is your blood pressure. And yet we measure it with these arcane instruments. I mean, it's akin to using a, a little wooden ruler from first grade to do construction. Okay, So it's a, it's a whole level of technology that is ripe for invention for the young people out there who are going to be future engineers. But how we measure blood pressure now is you know, listening to a sound change as the cuff pressure goes down. Okay. That's okay. Moby... You take a chill pill. Yeah, you, okay. Do you want, is your you blood want pressure getting up, Pooch? you want to add to this? Okay. Um, so, all right. Now, let me ask you this. All right. Um, how do you know? Give us, give us, and I'm going to tell you. How do you know you have high blood pressure or you're dealing with high blood pressure and I need to make an appointment with you? I need to check. What, what are the things that I should be aware of? Well, that number... Right. And, and well, wait a minute. No, no, let me stop you there. That number. Most of us don't run around checking that number okay, that's until that day. Until that day, you come in the office. Doctors, almost all doctors now, check blood pressure. That's okay, I'm normally not going to the doctor. Okay. What are some of the things? I'm not. I'm just using this for. I'm, I'm what normally not yeah. going to the okay. doctor. Yeah. Uh, I'm running around, and I think I might. Somebody might say to me. You act like you got high blood pressure or something. Have you checked your blood? What are some of the signs that I should start looking for? So, so good question. I would say in my personal experience, nine out of 10 people do not have any feeling whatsoever for their blood pressure. They come in the office with, you know, stroke material, like 190 over 120, which gets my attention. And they don't feel it at all. Really? So, yes. So high blood pressure does not... You can go around unaware completely unaware and so that's why checking your blood pressure occasionally just checking in while do, why doctors make a routine of checking blood pressures even though you know while hypertension is a very common diagnosis it's not everybody not even near everybody so we get a lot of normal blood pressures in the office because we want to find that untreated one um, so, so yeah so you don't most people don't feel high blood pressure and I guess the other point I was trying to put back on that is being once diagnosed with high blood pressure and not knowing if you're under control is not good enough. Okay. So your doctor checks that blood pressure and if they see the numbers are still too high, they add, they change or add medicines. And similarly, if you have a diagnosis of high blood pressure with the co in, inexpensive cost now of home machines, get a home machine. All right. So let me say this. Okay. So. Just sharing personally, I, I take blood pressure medicine, and I've had for several years. Uh, and I, I'm, I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and get in trouble. I'm visiting the doctor, yeah. so I take blood pressure medicine I've had for years. And my my wife will say, "Is your blood pressure up?" I, I have a headache. Yeah. I have a headache, and she'll say, "Is your blood pressure up?" I'll say, "No, I know the difference in a blood pressure headache." Some people do. I mean, any time I've dealt with high blood pressure, right here, the top of the back of my head is going to come off, mm -hmm. and and I I call that a blood pressure. Yeah. Like I will I will take that serious. I'll say, yeah, I, something's wrong. But here, is that different? I mean, what am well, I describing? It's, it's what I'm trying to say is that you don't. Most people do not feel their blood pressure. Okay. Now, some people feel a pounding in their ears. Some people get red faced. You know, some people have a pounding in their head, but that's really the rare person who feels their blood pressure. Okay. All right. Well, I I, I do now. I get uh, I get messages from viewers throughout the week, like, you know, check check your because sometimes I get a little upset on the show and I get passionate and you know, 
about what I do, and they'll say, slow down, slow down, you know, your, your face Stress is Stress can elevate your blood pressure. Okay. Yeah. Anxiety can elevate your blood pressure. So yeah, there are emotional and, and environmental causes. You know, we, we say or we think a lot about salt elevating blood pressure. They're really not, in, in reality, there are not a lot of people who are that salt sensitive. Uh, in my earlier training, uh, first thing you did when, when patients were diagnosed with hypertension, you, t you told them to cut the salt out of their diet. Right. Everybody tries to hide it from me. Yeah. So uh, that's really not a thing. There are patients who, have, who are very salt sensitive. Heart, salt is much more of a, a problem for heart failure patients because it affects your fluid balance. But it, it, my, in my personal experience, it's not a big deal for blood pressure patients. And I'd much rather people learn how to eat healthy than mess with diet and make, them, make themselves unhappy with their diet. We've we got to be happy with our diet. Well, I, you know, we, we're going this direction, and, and that's what I want to do is have some general conversations about things that people deal with every day. Um, the, the other thing, and we'll get off this subject, is, you know, okay, so I take my blood pressure medicine every day. Most of the time, outside of a cold or something, I feel great. Okay, and I'm not. I'm. I'm not checking. I know, baby. I know. We got. Put He's up a with dog him. whisperer. Yes. Um, hush. I know that um, I, I feel good. So I don't go and check it every day. Is, yeah. is that wrong? Should I? No, I don't want you to overcheck it. I have patients who check it like three or four times a day. I think that's too much. Right, but I want you to know what your blood pressure is, and I'm, you know, it, you really—it's a personal thing. Some people, <clears throat> they can check it once a month, and they're fine, and everything's fine, no problem. And there's some people that they—they're on three medicines, and their blood pressure is highly variable, and they may have a sense of things being wrong. They probably should be checking it every day, or certainly when they have symptoms. All right, let's switch to something else, and you brought it up: anxiety. Mm -hmm. Is that—is that different today in today's world? than it was 30 years ago? Are, are, are more other, people other than dealing? Our language, I, I don't think there's any difference in it at all. Well, <laughs> not, not the anxiety itself, but are more people dealing with it? Do you, do you see more dealing with it now than, you know, 20 years ago, you know, some of the pressures in the world? And what is anxiety? I mean, just seriously, what is anxiety? Are there different levels? Uh, when do you feel somebody should, you know, handle it with medication? Yeah. So I use, I use the analogy in, in my thinking about it of kind of us being primal, primal humans. If you're walking through the woods and you hear a rustling back in the leaves or in the grass and you turn around you, know, and you feel a little anxiety come over you and you turn around and you see there's a saber-toothed tiger stalking you, that's anxiety. That's a functional anxiety. That's your brain wired to say, danger. Right. Right. Danger. I need to attend to this. Right. But, or, but we're wired for that. We're wired. We're hardwired for that because right. those of us that were not hardwired for that got eaten. Okay. Right? So that anxiety is real. Is, is part, real. Okay. It's part, of, it's part of our wiring. Now, the question now is do we have things going on in our life that we've either blocked or we've not yet become aware of that are about to eat us emotionally? Not, I'm not talking about physically chew us up, break our bones. I'm just talking about they're about to destroy our lives. And that's functional reality. Okay? So if I try to medicate that anxiety out of someone, I may be dumbing them down. I may be saying, listen, I really want you to do an inventory of what's going on in your life and in your relationships and in your everything and answer yourself some questions there. Is there something that you're not attending to that you, you're bothered about? that you really need to go look at and deal with. You know, it may not be simple. It may take some time to figure it out. So just giving somebody an anxiolytic is not necessarily helpful. Now, there are some people who have been either so traumatized or they've been so beat down or something's gone on that they, they have out-of-control anxiety. It's just, just whipping them. It's just you know, it's making them unable to function. And so that's somebody to consider putting on an anxiolytic. Uh, there are some people who are going through an extreme reaction that, you know, their wife may have died, their husband may have died, their dad may have, you know, they've lost somebody and they're out of control grief. 
Now, most of the time, I want people to deal with their grief. I'm, well, almost every, not most of the time, every time I want someone to deal with their grief. I want them to talk about the loved one. I want them to talk about the loss, to verbalize it, because that's how, that's how we as humans deal with those heavy emotional things, is we, we put the verbal part of our brain in the gear, and we bring those words out in front of us, and we say them. And we can like almost reprogram ourselves, unconsciously reprogram ourselves as we verbalize what that primal feeling is. When uh, so, let me see. So uh, I don't want to break it down into three areas, but we have the anxiety that is it, you 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 should be wired with it. It's the look behind me and it's a bear, mm -hmm. and we all should have that. And as you said, if you you don't, those are the ones that get eaten. Uh, so then we have an anxiety that may require maintenance, uh, may, may require a maintenance medication because it's an ongoing anxiety that you're, you're living with and dealing with. Yeah. And then there's an anxiety that you lost a loved one or going through something mm -hmm. traumatic. Right. And that, that may be a short period of time that you may mm -hmm. take a medication or something to maintain yeah. that. Yeah. Right? Right. All right, let me change let me change this. When general practitioner, when somebody comes to sit down and see you, and we talked about this a long time ago and several times, but you just can't talk about it enough. Um, I always love one uh, men, if your wife let's see tell me where I'm wrong. Men, if your wife wants to go with you, let her go. Right? It, to the doctor's office, absolutely. And then if she wants to come in, <laughs> let her That's come in. That's another whole level of decision huh? there. But <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> no. I'm getting right No, If you want to let her come in. Yeah. And then when the doctor says, what's bothering you today? And you say, my foot hurts. And your wife looks over and says, now tell him why your foot hurts. Don't get upset, right? You absolutely don't get upset because usually I'm first thing I'm doing I'm looking at the wife and then I'm looking at the fella right thing. Okay. so what can, I, what can, I, is there any little squealing we can do here about what's really going on because it, most it, of my guys live in on the river of denial exactly that's okay. we're talking about men and, and if they come by themselves they're matter of fact they go to the doctor I'm gonna say most men go to the doctor like they need an extension cord at Walmart they know the aisles to go down, they take a left, they take a right, they go down, they get the 100 foot off, they come back, take a left, a right, cash register in the car. Yeah. And that's the way to go to the doctor. Am I correct? Well, yeah. And, a and lot yeah, of us. Think about it. I mean, we, when our cars break down or something goes wrong with them, they ain't going to fix themselves. We know that as men. Right. right? And you can, you, can run, you can run that thing with low oil for so long and then you're going to pay for it. Patient. Now, go ahead. I'm sorry. But, but us, us humans... We have these incredible bodies that fix themselves. We right. live with these bodies all of our life. They, you know, we get cut, they heal. Right. You know, we break a bone, it heals. I mean, so we have these incredible bodies that fix themselves until they don't. But we don't know how to change that gear. So, so the hard thing for my guy, my ladies, you know, early on, they're having periods and they're having babies and they're having, they're engaged with the healthcare profession, so that they know. This is a, an industry that has certain things that help me with my life and make things better. Us guys, you know, we get the sports physical, turn your head and cough, you know, see, see you when you're sick until, we, until we're um, 30 and our blood pressure starts going wrong or we start getting Dunlap disease or, or various other things, and then we just try to ignore those forever. But sooner or later, the warranty goes out and we've got problems and we need to attend to them. But our minds never really turn that over. And I'm saying this from a personal level. Our minds never turn that over and say, well, geez, maybe I should do something about this. So let me, let's go to one of the common ones that you haven't asked yet, but we talk about is benign prosthetic hypertrophy. What? BPH, benign prosthetic hypertrophy. Guys get older. They get up at night to pee. Right. right? So I ask them, how many times you get up at night to pee? Well, if you're a young guy, you don't get up at night to pee. You know, right. You go pee when you go to bed. Pee when you get up. You get older. You get up once, twice. Well, by the third time you're getting up at night, now we're getting three hours of sleep at a time. Right. That ain't healthy. Not healthy. 
So, but our, but I've got guys coming in and say, I get up every hour. I get up every two hours. I'm like, that's you're telling me that you never get more than two hours of solid sleep at a time. That cannot be healthy, just from the neurological perspective. Okay. Well, we here. So, so what's what's so confusing? We have in our medical profession the word benign. It's like idiopathic hypertension. Idiopathic is Latin for I don't know. I don't know why you have high blood pressure. Why don't we doctors just say, I don't know why you have high blood pressure. You have high blood pressure. Not Use the big fancy word idiopathic. Makes me sound smarter, I think. So benign prosthetic hypertrophy. Well, it's not benign if you're getting up three times a night. It's not benign if you're never fully emptying your bladder and you've got chronic low-grade bladder infections that are now doing things to, to the inside of your prostate, inside of your, your, the cyst, the bladder that we live with. So it's not necessarily benign. We've just learned to live with it. And the doctors use benign because it's not cancer, right? Because if a cancer patient will come in and they're getting up every hour or so, or they're pissing blood every so often, and they, they're like, there's something wrong here. And the doctor goes and looks and finds cancer and says, okay, well, we got prostate cancer, or we got bladder cancer, we need to do something about it. So, quote, that's not benign. That, that's not good thinking, right? The more common thing is BPH. And the more common thing needs to be addressed and treated because it is treatable. It's very treatable. Uh, uh, you know, let me say this, and 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 uh, you know, in, in what short time we have, when when it comes in, because I, I I have a list of questions up. When someone comes in to visit you, uh, what what are some of the top questions you want them to ask you, and 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 how? How, like, you know, when you're prescribing a medication, like, okay, I'm going to give you this. Is it, is it bother you? I, the only way to put it, if I say, why are you prescribing that? What, it, what is, what is that? What is that? Oh, do, I want that do question you, asked. Do you want those questions? Yes. And, and, and you know, I'm showing a little bit of my world experience, life experience and bias, but my men don't ask that question. My ladies know what they're taking and why they're exactly. taking it. Exactly. My men are saying, well, I was told to take this, and this is what I take, and I don't know what it does. It says three times a day. Three times a day. That's what or it once says. once a day, and I don't know what so it does. So you come home. You're hitting, you're hitting it out of the park. Yeah. So you come home. What did, wife, what did the doctor tell you? Well, he, he prescribed this. I went to the drugstore. Mm. They had it ready. What is it? I don't know. What's the name on the bottle? I don't know. Yeah. I take it three times a day. Yeah. It's so amazingly common that you're putting something in your body that's powerful because it's powerful because we've distilled that chemical, that element down to something the size of a pill. And we're giving it to you and we're changing your body with it. And you don't know what it's doing or what its name is. Not okay. What, what about this, okay? Um, you know, a mechanic one time said to me, I can, I, I can, fix, I can fix a woman's car better than I could fix a man's car because a man comes into the shop. This mechanic told me this one thing. Man comes into the shop and tells me what's wrong with it. Tells me what's wrong with the car. Women come in, bring the car, tell me the sound it's making. When they turn the wheel to the left, they turn it to the right or whatever, I can fix that car. All right. But men come in and tell me what's wrong with the car. Yeah. Is it, is it, I, I'm not trying, I don't know if I'm trying to. No, nah, I don't know if that's the case because women don't come in and tell me what's wrong with them. They'll ask. Men will but come what in I'm and say there's is, nothing wrong with them. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. There's everything like that. That It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's totally, Listen, I'm not making an association to a mechanic and yeah. the doctor, but I'm just saying when women come in, they handle their visit much different than men. Yeah, they do. Hey, listen, can I ask for help from the green room? Sure. Oh, no. Rick, would you take him out for a minute? Okay. Yeah, Rick, come on. He's, he's got the. Uh, maybe yeah. I need to. You're you're on uh, you're on pup detail. Pup detail. You may recognize this guy. He's in waiting. No, no. You set him down. He'll stay right at your feet. But see if he needs to go out there and do. You got rules. Yeah, the rules. It's raining out. No, he can stay right there in the under the covers there. All, All right. right. So, so let's, yeah. But I guess what I was getting at is we we the things we do in life from from the doctor or whatever we we just naturally approach them different and when when you when you uh, you know we sit here we've talked about it before when you have a patient come in uh, i mean man man or woman you have a patient come in 
I mean, nowadays, a lot of the doctors are under constraints of, you know, just filling out a chart and working with the insurance company. Do you like making sure you have a conversation with your patients? Is that important? Well, and a, get, them, get them to start talking about things? And it, when did you start it's feeling so this? It's so important that if I'm pushed further and further into the former of what you just said, which is where our profession is going, is I have no interest in that. I have no interest in cookbook medicine. Here's the symptom. Here's the diagnosis. Here's the treatment. Document this so you can get paid. I have no interest in that. First of all, it doesn't work. And second of all, it's so impersonal, it's insulting. No, I really want, I, I like to kid around with my patients. I like to converse with them. I like pulling these things out that we're talking about. You know, where, where the, it is right. a challenge. The guy is not, he's not thinking, he's not, he's not being malicious to himself. He's just letting him think about these things. Right. So I have to ask lots of questions, and then one question and one answer will lead to another. So, yeah, I, I uh, the, the latter is what's important. I fear that my profession and my younger peers are being brought up in the cookbook world um, and and I don't know who's going to take care of the Bill Whaley's and I as we get older because we're getting older but mostly Bill not not me so much can I so. I want I want I'm gonna ask this I want to tell a little something on you yeah so you go visit this guy right he's sitting there and he's talking to you and it just right in the conversation he doesn't tell you what he's doing and he just goes to the little cabinet opens it pulls out a five pound bag of flour and he hands it to you. He says, just hold that there. And you're thinking like he's going to tell you something significant. And he keeps talking to you. And then all of a sudden he says, would you, you like carrying that five-pound bag of flour? Right? That's what he, yeah, did I, I tell I pull, something? I pull, I pull. Did, I tell, did I tell something on you? No, I, but, I do that because yeah. I want, I want <laughs> patients to realize what they're walking around with. Right. They're never, But you, they can put that bag down and walk out of the office, but they're – the, the other weight they can't put down. They're dragging that around day in and day out. Exactly. Yeah. So I had to Unaware. tell that. Yeah, I, All right. So in closing, is there something today you wanted to discuss or you was thinking about, you know, if I get an opportunity to talk to the audience about anything? Well, we, we, we have addressed COVID on this program for a couple of years now. Yes. And I, let me just do a quick update. Okay. okay. And, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but it's very important because – the quote official dump is not doing their job the public health people are not doing their job COVID is waning COVID omicron is and, and all COVIDs, by the way are treatable omicron is mild but the treatable part of the COVID is early treatment so two things have a doctor in your Rolodex that treats COVID, okay? Number two, have an understanding that if you get symptoms, you can call them early. I mean, I'm talking about day one. I'm not talking about the usual, I've got the flu, I, I think I can get through this. We still have COVID out there. Call day one, run the symptoms by your doctor, your treating doctor, and I'm going to emphasize why I keep saying that over and over again. Yeah, I thought but, I was hoping you would. Yeah. So your treating doctor, run the symptoms by them, and then he or she will direct you on what to do. Okay. Because the medicines that treat COVID treat it best early, including the new really expensive ones. Right. Okay. We're talking about in three days. Okay. That's a really tight window. But, you know, the, the anti-flu medicines that have been around now for, what, 10 years, have to be given in the first three or four days. If I get a patient with the flu and they come in day seven of symptoms, there's no reason for me that, to write them a hundred dollar prescription for medicine that's not going to change the duration of their flu. No reason. Okay. So they need to come. If they got flu, I need to diagnose in the first two or three days. All right. Now, why why is it I keep emphasizing this? Because there is there are a lot of my profession who are not treating COVID. More okay. than half. All right. Okay. In, in more I, than half more than are half not are, treating are not COVID. treating COVID. I find that reprehensible. Okay. Now, people like me that find that reprehensible are all over the country, quote, getting in trouble for for having those feelings. It's reprehensible. There are treatments for COVID, and they have to be given early. And the new study, the new medicines that are coming out that are making big pharma even more money, work early. Okay. So. 
take, the take home message is if you think you've got COVID, call your treating doctor who either treats with new medicines or old medicines, because both are safe. And, and get yourself treated if you're in that high risk group. Now, there are a lot of people with COVID that it's a cold now, or they don't even know they have it. They don't need to worry, but they need to call their doctor and, and not worry, okay? So, you know, nine out of 10 of my COVID patients now, I don't treat at all. I just, they're, a, they're low risk and their symptoms are so mild, I'll just say, well, watch this. By the way, you're getting your natural vaccine from Omicron. Omicron is vaccinating the world right now, better than the vaccines. Because we know that the Om people who have had a previous infection from COVID have a durable immunity. What do I mean by that? The, the immunity lasts indefinitely. We've not seen it go away. And it is a real immunity. They don't get sick or bad from it. Whereas the vaccines after 90 days in some people are completely ineffective. And worse, there are new studies, there are new data, it's not studies, there are data coming out because the data has been hidden from the public and from the doctors coming out that show that some of the vaccinated people are more prone to get COVID and more prone to carry it in their membranes. So they are spreading it. So it is the complete opposite of the mandates that have gone around by the tyrants of the world who said you've got to get vaccinated in order to make things safe. Actually, it may turn out as this data becomes public which has been criminally hidden from the public, is this data comes out that, that there are vaccinated people who are actually carrying COVID and mo are more infectious, not less. So all, all, everything's go back to normal. There is absolutely no reason for us to be under any emergency whatsoever. This is a treatable disease and there are plenty of doctors out there that treat. Something you said before we close you said Om Omicron is vaccinating the world. Yes. So, so think about it this way. When, when the early vaccines came out, uh, we, one whole class of vaccines was where you took the virus and you beat it up. You made it non-infectious, but it was still there, and you injected some amount of that virus into the body. Right. And the body recognized it as foreign, recognized what was foreign about it and built up immunity to it okay so you actually got the virus or shredded parts of the virus okay omicron's essentially doing that on its own it is a very mild virus it gets into the body the body says i can whip this and it whips it and it builds up all of that immunity not just the antibodies but the cellular immunity which is the real long lasting immunity and so the next time it runs into the cousin or descendant of the virus it'll say i've got this i know what this is dr tidman i appreciate it thank you very much it's been asked the doc with dr raymond tidman dr whaley will be back next week uh he'll be back with us next week and i appreciate it very much you can always find uh these on fyntv.com go on demand once our program is over if you go on the on demand or look there and also on the YouTube channel, uh, you can find these. We're going to take a break. Thank you very much. you got to get your puppy home. We have the all-star political panel. It's raining. Uh, anything else? Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. We'll be right back.